as a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty. You want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a distinguished returning guest tonight, Robert Ellis Smith, who is the founding editor of The Privacy Journal, the oldest journal on privacy in America is here with us on Reluctant Preppers once again. Robert, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Glad to be with you. We've had you talk in the past about some general topics regarding how people can safeguard their privacy, and I wondered if tonight we could delve specifically into three areas where unintentionally, just going with the flow of modern life, people uh, have been opting in uh, without necessarily fully considering the the implications and the impact on their on their loss of privacy uh, with some modern conveniences that turn out to be a two-edged sword. So if you could talk with us about three topics, the paperless office, bookless research, and the cashless society. And if we could just go ahead and start with each of those areas and... Um, uh, give give you a chance to really fill us in on the the implications that people need to be aware of of what they're giving up uh, in terms of privacy and some tips on what they can do to reclaim some of their privacy in each of these areas of their lives. Um, so if we could kick off with the paperless office, I remember back in the 1980s and even late 70s, there were these Xerox ads where they were just blowing our minds on the TV about how the, the office of the future was going to be so uh, advanced. It, you wouldn't need to have all these reams of paper all over and you're, you'd be basically scanning uh, and uh, electronically capturing things and, and, and everything could be done uh, without a lot of printing and a lot of paper. And uh, that seemed so uh, lightweight and fast and everything. And there is a lot of efficiency that comes with that. We all experience that. I have been starting a unofficial survey of young people uh, who didn't grow up where we did uh, with mailed letters, postal mail. Uh, and it takes me back to when I was a kid. I went on a field trip with my preschool class to a post office and they showed us all the sorting machines and then later on I went with Boy Scouts in, in junior high to, to a bigger post office in a bigger city and they showed us all their fancy uh, ways that they sort things and everything but it was all physical mail and also recalling from the movie Gone, uh, the, excuse me, The uh, Sound of Music where uh, Captain Von Trapp, one of the protagonists, is just outraged and incensed at this Nazi uh, leader who who seems to know he's telling him he knows the contents of a telegram that he received the night before and uh, captain von trapp snaps back he says i thought that the contents of telegrams in austria was private and we've all seen movies where people have they pull pull open a letter and it's all been either uh redacted by the censors during wartime or whatever but that idea of wartime censorship or people reading your reading your correspondence is almost uh it, it seems like something that would have to happen in, in a propaganda uh, time or a war time. But uh, when I was doing this informal survey of uh, starting with young people of how long, how many times in the past year, not counting their tax return, a college application or a job application, have they actually either handwritten or typed up something and physically put it in an envelope and sent it or received a correspondence like that? Uh, it seems like it's almost a completely lost uh uh, art or lost activity almost entirely replaced with email, which seems to take us full circle right back to where uh, we have the, the essentially the Gestapo reading every one of our correspondences, which used to be unthinkable. But now we just shrug our shoulders and opt in. So can you talk to us a little bit about the phenomenon of how the paperless office and, and electronic communication has led to a loss of privacy and some ideas on how people can regain privacy in that particular area of correspondence? Yeah, uh, I remember uh, writing my book about uh, privacy in American history and talking about the shock that must have come to people to think that their very private messages, their telegrams, were in the hands of one large private corporation, namely Western Union. And in fact, as those messages went from place to place, they passed by the eyes of uh, many, many uh, people, anonymous people. Uh, there were problems with breaches of uh, Telegrams, but I don't think there was as much consternation, consternation as, as there is now. Uh, 
we are allowing large search engines, and Google is the major one, obviously, to keep uh, track of uh, our searches and uh, in many cases to respond to government orders uh, to produce that information. Not about all of us, of course, but about uh, many of us. And uh, we are not what we search. Um, I know in my work, and I'm sure in yours, you search a lot of things that you don't believe in. You get uh, access to documents and information that uh, do not define you, but uh, are part of uh, your work or, or your interest. And in our private lives, we uh, go to sites to plan travel and to find a restaurant and to uh, <laughs> learn more about the world around us. And we shouldn't, and, and we, I know lots of people, including myself and friends, now go on the internet to get questions about medical conditions. Um, and we all realize that it's not definitive and we don't always know the source of it, but it's a good starting point to go to the internet and find out uh, whether something that's ailing you is serious or not. So that doesn't mean that you have the condition <laughs> and uh, you may be inquiring about uh, on behalf of a friend or something. But uh, So I don't think we should be judged by our searches, but uh, that is a huge database that is now available to the government. And not so much on a, a daily basis uh, during real time, but it is available for searches as if the government uh, takes an interest in it. Secondly, email, which I described uh, years ago when it was first uh, offered to individuals as a postcard. It will most likely find itself your message to the people you intend it to without any intrusion, but you you must know that it's not a sealed envelope, even though that we call it mail, and people should realize that. It's really akin to a, a postcard. And uh, as you were uh, asking whether we have, in fact, uh, exchanged handwritten or even typed correspondence with somebody else in a sealed envelope, I was thinking of a postcard. I'm not sure that, that uh, we receive many postcards anymore either. But uh, people should regard email as a postcard, something that in most cases will not be read by others simply because there isn't that capability, that interest to, to do it uh, um, on, on that massive scale. But nonetheless, we should treat it as not a first-class sealed letter, but as a message that, uh, like the telegram in early days, is available to uh, many prying eyes if, in fact, they, they care. And then the next area is online banking. Uh, I experimented myself uh, when it first become, became offered because I found it a, a, a great uh, possible convenience, and I tested it first. I had heard rumors that it disclosed Social Security numbers and that it disclosed all sorts of other things about ourselves, and uh, I tried it uh, only with minor payments and with an account that had uh, only a few dollars in it, and uh was satisfied that it was a, a very good service and that the uh, chances of invasion of privacy were were quite low. Uh, uh, as people may or may not know, uh, during uh, most of the period prior to the Internet, the government required the, um, the photocopying, the uh, capturing of the front and back of every single check that passed through your account um, so that uh, that information always had been uh, preserved and available to the government, and they needed very little cause to get at it. <clears throat> well, that information now is available in digital form, as most people know. Uh, sometimes a, cha a copy of the check or simply a notation of the electronic signal that was sent uh, in payment of a obligation or, or as a deposit into your account. I'm satisfied that it, it, the possible invasion of privacy uh, is worth it on that count. Um, those are uh, several of the areas where uh, everything now is digital, and it does mean that it is kept in a database. Uh, there is a concept of uh, uh, protection by fog, which is the concept that just because of the massive amounts of digital uh, uh, information available, that that's a protection of privacy in itself. The, the information available is just so vast that no one agency, no one individual, no one government can really keep track of it all, so maybe that'll give us uh, some reassurance. But uh, we are in a new era now where this information uh, that uh, we generate is being stored in giant archives, and to some extent we know the availability, but another, to another extent uh, we don't. It does generally require a court process uh, to get at your bank information, 
Um, and the same is true of emails. They do have some legal protection. Um, but search engines uh, don't. They're, 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 they don't require a, a federal process to, for the government to get at them. And the search engines have shown themselves quite willing to provide that information. Is there such a thing as an anonymous search that you can do using your own your own computer at home without having to go to a library or something like that to use their computer? Yes, indeed. Uh, first of all, you, you can mask your IP address. I'm not sure how that is done, but that can be done. Uh, but secondly, uh, Bing, uh, which is Microsoft's offering, uh, seems to allow uh, much more anonymity than uh, does does Google and does not track uh, every one of your searches. There is a service in uh, Holland named iQuick, which is a search engine that does no tracking whatsoever. So that is available uh, to people. Um, you know, it, your question reminds me that our, our view of, at least our view in the privacy community of anonymity, uh, has changed radically because of uh, search engines. Uh, we used to argue the right of people to be anonymous whether involved in political speech or correspondence or personal activities. Now I'm not so sure because uh, anonymity allows people to post all sorts of scurrilous things about other persons on the net. Uh, they may be provoked by some personal confrontation. They may not be. They may simply not have a life and in the privacy of their home want to smack talk uh, other individuals and make their life miserable. Well, we're seeing an awful lot of that. And indeed, some of the sites that are uh, encouraging this are located off, off, uh, away from our borders, overseas. Uh, do not respect the right of a person to see information posted about him and to rebut it if necessary. They tell you to get lost if you want to exercise those rights. Uh, the people who post this stuff are all anonymous, and uh, that's caused many of us to reevaluate the value of anonymity. And uh, I, uh, Google, of course, links to these sites, and uh, that only provides further uh, distress for these individuals. So uh, I think all of us have to reevaluate the value of anonymous speech. It can be very damaging to people now on the Internet. Uh, it's no longer uh, a nasty note posted on a bulletin board or even put in a newspaper. It has worldwide uh, distribution and permanence, too. There's no sign that these sites are going to die at all. When you mentioned uh, search history, I'm, I'm taken back to when we used to have uh, take our children to the library. We were homeschoolers, and uh, the the big effort it took before we would leave the library, we made every child write down every title of every book that they were going to take out and write them down on a piece of paper so we could have these lists. And when it came time to round up the books at the end of the, at the loan period and take them back, we made sure we weren't going to get charged for anything. But then I... I thought the suggestion I made to the library, I said, hey, why don't you just give us a checkout receipt like you do at the grocery store? Just give us a list of all the titles we checked out. They said, oh, we couldn't do that because of privacy reasons. And of course, that doesn't that argument doesn't really hold water because they're they, and they later did implement that very system. In fact, they would hand you your own list of titles when you when you checked out. That's what people expect normally today. But the idea that the titles that you do check out at the library are your private information and that are not publicly uh, available to anybody else in your community, not even to your, your husband or wife, um, is is a, one of the pil pillars of information privacy and uh, personal privacy uh, that's been upheld by the library system, at least in my limited experience. However, it seems like with these search engines, as you mentioned, the things that you search, they come right back and start uh, you know, showing you ads for things that are related. It's like, and it's even if people have told me that even if they if they search on, if they get onto somebody's Facebook friend site or something, they'll start to see those ads come up there too. It's like it follows you all over. So uh, it really does seem that it's, it's very difficult to uh, avoid this sense of, um, of being traced and followed up on uh, for your searching history. So I think people really might be interested in the in an anonymous search option. I also heard, and maybe you know whether it's true or not, this was a urban legend that came out right after the Boston Marathon bombing that some family, uh, the mom was searching for pressure cookers and the dad was searching for backpacks on the same day at the, from the same household and a SWAT team showed up at their door because those two, the intersection of those two searches was considered a MO for the uh, Boston Marathon bomber type uh, suspect. So as far as 
you you can even invoke you know unintended uh, response from from law enforcement though your actions are completely innocent have you I'm not surprised I don't know that particular story but I do know that people who were searching for uh, pressure cookers at that time were subjected to interest by uh, law enforcement of course those were frenetic days uh, when law enforcement was desperate to find the culprits and uh, they indeed did uh, zero in on people who had particularly done that the library community has been very diligent about uh, recognizing uh, a right to uh, patrons privacy even though it took them a while to to get there but just about every state thanks to the librarians has a law that does uh, uh, say that uh, information about borrowers uh, shall remain um, uh, confidential including uh, information about kids who use the library and that's extremely important uh, uh, however along came the private uh, the uh, Patriot Patriot Act uh, right after the uh, bombings in uh, 2001 and uh, that, that uh, in essence, uh, told librarians that they couldn't resist government demands for information about people who would use the library and indeed uh, impose what's called a, 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 a gag order, ordered um, librarians not to even notify anybody that they had faced such a demand, even a lawyer who could help them out. Well, that's been released so somewhat, and the gag order is no longer in place. But um, it, it is true that uh, law enforcement has a particular interest in library records and will try as hard as they can, can to get access, sometimes bullying librarians, sometimes uh, deceiving them about what the law does and does not require. But mainly in every state, uh, there is protection for librarians uh, not to uh, uh, release that sort of information. Uh, well, the same thing does not apply once again uh, to web searches. And uh, uh, it's uh, interesting that uh, we used to tell people to uh, use a library if they wanted to have an anonymous search and not have it traced to them. Uh, now uh, the reverse may be true, and it may be wise to uh, use your home computer for sensitive searches because you can uh, delete the history at the end of the day. Um, you can't always be sure that a library, a library is going to delete your um, searching uh, fingerprints trail, your footprints at the end of the day, I've gone to some libraries and found out that they did not uh, delete any of that. Uh, so uh, perhaps it's best if you have sensitive searches uh, to do them at home. And uh, unpredictability is always a protector of privacy. Uh, one should alter one's searches, do them at different times of day, uh, uh, maybe alter the language you use in a search, that sort of thing so that uh, any pattern that you may establish is disrupted at some point and that'll throw the research that'll show the throw the um, investigators off track i think you mentioned earlier social security numbers and uh, i was looking up and checking out it was i thought it was related to the a response to the great depression and part of the great the great uh, you know government response to that uh and it looks like it did start in 1936 and uh Look, one question is, since our country started essentially with the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and, and, uh, and the uh, Constitution uh, later on, how did we get along for the first 160 years of our country's history without anybody having a Social Security number? And why is it considered absolutely you know, uh, essential today? And you can't open a bank account, you can't, do, you can't get a job, you can't do a whole bunch of things without, without a Social Security number. Yeah, well, the, the answer in short is we didn't have a system of providing government-sponsored pensions for individuals, and because there were so many millions to keep track of, the government said that it needed a number to keep track of, of people. It uh, swore, it promised, it said over and over again that this number would not be used for any other purpose, and that was a very big concern in the 1930s when this was first established, especially by labor unions who thought that it would be used uh, to blackball uh, uh, certain uh, union members and many many immigrants said we uh, came to these shores to escape that kind of enumeration in Europe and we're afraid of it and so the government gave all sorts of assurances uh, in the uh, mid 40s under the Roosevelt administration it became 
the taxpayer ID number, and that's when the floodgates opened. It became the Medicare number about a decade later. And on and on it increased, and then there was a, a, a kind of a cessation of that trend and maybe even a reversal finally in the late 1990s. But uh, it is used as a bank account identifier, if not the bank account number, but a bank identifier. The Patriot Act doesn't require that banks collect it, but sort of uh, authorizes them to and probably in, encourages them to. Um, it, it has been, the, as people's instinct have told them, uh, the main uh, uh, means for gathering information uh, about them. Um, and uh, consequently, many agencies, many businesses uh, have recognized this and have kind of backed off. But many of them are asking for the last four digits, and I don't think that's adequate protection, uh, simply because people can piece together the rest of the information. Uh, the first three digits tell uh, roughly what state you were in when you were issued the number, so that in many ways it relieves it. It it uh, uh, it discontinues some of the anonymity that we we would have. For instance, if you're posting uh, grades in a university by uh, social security numbers, that might give an indication about out-of-state students. You could figure out who was who. The middle two um, tell roughly uh, when you applied for the number, and so, so could roughly tell your age bracket. Um, it does not stand for a year, but it is the government's way of uh, codifying uh, when roughly uh, you were issued the uh, the number. And the last four are sequential, or and uh, so that uh, if if you provide your last four digits and they're they're in the hands of uh, an unscrupulous person, they would not have difficulty piecing together the rest of the uh, account. I would recommend people Google their names and the last four digits of their social security number and see what they come up with. And I'll bet they'll be surprised that it's not great protection to provide information on your name together with your last four digits of your social security number. I think people's birth dates are more protective, and they break ties. May another reason many agencies want the social security number is to distinguish people with the same name, et cetera. Well, um, birth dates uh, do that almost almost to a degree of certainty, and I think do not uh, intrude upon people's privacy. Some businesses are using a driver's license number. And although I can't see any danger to that right now, I think I could see that um, unanticipated dangers could come later on. And so I'd recommend people not do that and use their birth date if they uh, want uh, the agency uh, insists that they want it. Many, many times you talk to a bank, you talk to a business, uh, and they want to get at your account. They'll ask for your Social Security number, usually in an automated way, too. They want you to punch in the digits before you get even to talk to anybody. And I think that's extremely unwise. And I think that we as consumers ought to teach uh, these organizations that uh, they can't have our social security numbers if they, uh, you know, as a condition of doing business with them. And uh, are the, can you think of specific the cases where you feel that it is in fact legally mandated that you must provide your social security number? Because you, you really surprised me this time when you said that the bankers make it seem like you need to because I got to tell you when we went in to get checking accounts or savings accounts for our uh, minor children that's and it was shortly after 9-11 and I believe they told me you have to give us their you have to actually give us show us their social security cards and so we did that uh, in order to open bank accounts for them because there was this idea that, oh, everybody's trying to launder money and that sort of thing and, and they're draining the swamp or whatever. But it, it you're you're clarifying to us that that's strongly suggested or encouraged, but it's not absolutely. Yeah, that's not the case. The, the law is uh, know your customer, and it was part of uh, the um, laws imposed after uh, 9-11. And it simply said, say banks have to uh, be diligent in identifying who their customers are that usually means they'll want a driver's license, but they interpret that as encouraging demands for social security numbers, sometimes even demanding the social security card, which a lot of people don't have. But that's not the law. The law is simply that banks have to identify you with some degree of certainty and uh, have to explain to the government uh, if they weren't able to do that. So 
Um, it is the Medicare and Medicaid card for medical insurance purposes, um, although I believe now the U.S. Department of Health uh, has uh, and Welfare has, has discontinued that. So that was the last bastion, really, of required the demands for the Social Security number. It is our taxpayer ID number. It's, that's the way uh, it, well, it didn't originate that way, but that was the second extended use of it. Um, I, I think that's proper and generally safe to provide that for any tax-generated transaction, including getting a job, even getting I think they're entitled to have your Social Security number for reporting purposes. Uh, you may be able to argue you don't care. Well, no, wait a minute. That wouldn't help, no, because they are obligated to report income. Uh, but the income from interest is so slight, you wonder why they even worry about it. Yeah. But any any transaction that is uh, connected to taxes, I believe, is a legitimate uh, request for a Social Security uh, don't it's legitimate to demand it of students, whether in higher education or uh, at the secondary level. Some states have laws uh, that uh, it can't be demanded. So we have a law in this state, uh, in Rhode Island, and you can only guess who was the one that pushed for it, but uh, that uh, companies uh, cannot uh, ask for Social Security numbers uh, as a condition of doing business. And we amended it a couple of years later saying they couldn't demand all or part of the Social Security number. Unfortunately, it doesn't cover financial institutions, but uh, other than that, uh, utilities, for instance, now uh, cannot uh, demand it in the state of Rhode Island. Back to uh, the financial topic then, speaking of the cashless society, uh, you mentioned specifically online banking, and uh, it, but if can you talk to us about the, the natural does any of this have to do with natural law? And maybe that's some of the things that you have studied or some of your contributors have studied that uh, that you've uh, allowed as an editor into your publication. What what does natural law have to say about the in- intrinsic rights of the individual to privacy? And is, is, our, is our financial life uh, one of those areas where we need to be wary not to surrender uh, our, our natural right to privacy? Well, more than natural rights, it's in our Constitution that uh, uh, any rights, it's in our Bill of Rights, any rights not enumerated here in the Bill of Rights is retained by the people, um, and it's not commonly used uh, uh, by uh, lawyers who are um, protecting constitutional rights. Um, uh, I think it was Madison who said that uh, we uh, can't enumerate every single right here, and uh, I think it was Franklin, Ben Franklin, who said we might just as well put into the Constitution that a man has a right to wear a hat. We're not going to be able to enumerate everything, so we want this all-purpose amendment that will say if we didn't think to include it, it belongs to the people. It doesn't belong to the government. So that's uh, one protection, and that's one place where the right to privacy uh, derives. Uh, I think it also derives strongly from the First Amendment, uh, which says that there is a right not only to practice one's religion freely, but to uh, enunciate and to hold beliefs uh, free from government intrusion. And you can't very well do that unless parts of the brain are sacrosanct from government intrusion. Uh, that's, I think, where a lot of privacy rights derive, and call that a natural right, if, if you will. Um, I think that what uh, some of the great philosophers of Europe we're talking about prior to the finding of founding of this country uh, were natural rights of, of privacy, the right to be let alone, including the right to uh, not have the king be able to intrude upon your residence, regardless of how humble it was. But that was a holding of English law for many, many years and really found its way into our, our Constitution in our uh, Fourth Amendment. Yeah, that's where we start to get really close to the heart of the matter here about about um, when our thoughts can be tracked and by evidence of our thoughts, then how, how much do we surrender the right to even have free thoughts and not that they would be, uh, uh, they would, consequences would come down on us and we would be, lose privileges in this, in this fully connected and, and digital age because we're having the wrong thoughts or showing evidence that we're having the wrong thoughts. 
and uh, certainly that can be by what we searched or what we read or what we uh, transmitted in, in writing, but even uh, or, or what we transacted. Um, so what you've you've mentioned in the past just briefly the idea of uh, about uh, you had a term for it and I don't recall what the term was something about our thought privacy. Uh, on tonight's conversation? No, it was in a previous a, a previous interview that we well, did. Well, there's a concept I, re I really like uh, devised by a, a federal appeals court called personhood. Well, that's really what we're talking about. It's the, it's the sanctity of the individual, I think, to hold thoughts and to hold beliefs and to act on those and to advocate uh, points of view and to practice religion. I think it's, it's personhood. He said that these are the casual activities of walking down the street of strolling in the park, uh, of uh, walking around and not being able to give a good account of yourself, of wanting to ride a bike instead of an automobile. He called it personhood, and I think uh, privacy raises the concept of autonomy, and I think that, too, has always helped me, that uh, when we think of privacy as protecting secrecy, it only gets us so far. Privacy really protects the autonomy of the individual, the right to live one's life free of intrusion, especially if uh, or the way one conducts one's life is not bothering anybody else. So call it autonomy or personhood. I think that the right to privacy uh, subsumes both of those concepts. Yeah, you're, this is exactly where I hoped we could get to. And you, when you mentioned one more that I had completely uh, left off of the questions I'd asked you, and that's a freedom to move about freely. In fact, that, that one is also mentioned explicitly in the Constitution is, is the ability, you know, the right of, of free people to be able to to move from place to place. Um, and uh, But again, <laughs> we, uh, we have now the... Uh, the easy pass uh, tracker on our vehicle so that we can save a few minutes of the drive and save a few cents or dollars each time we go on a tollway. Uh, but now our vehicles, every movement is being tracked uh, on the interstate. And is that yet another, now we have uh, what they call safety cameras popping up all over the metro where we live. And supposedly this is causing a great uh, revenue source for the local police department from all their red light tickets that they're uh, able to hand out automatically this way with, without ever having an officer on the scene because everybody's being observed all the time. And uh, there was an article about uh, two years ago that came out where uh, I believe it was Santa Cruz, no, it was um, San Diego, California Police Department asking individual homeowners to opt in for the police to be able to monitor their uh, household video cameras uh, while they're away at work and that sort of thing so that uh, they could help uh, guard against intruders, that sort of thing. In how many areas of our society are we unknowingly just surrendering, just abdicating our natural right to autonomy and and uh, essentially, as you mentioned, uh, free choice, free speech, free uh, freedom of movement, freedom to do what we what we choose as long as it doesn't infringe on the rights of others. Yeah, first of all, the right to travel has been recognized as part of the Constitution um, by the U.S. Supreme Court. M most of those cases involved access to passports, if you were controversial, or the right to uh, uh, travel abroad, uh, restrictions on your travel. Some of those cases, though, have involved uh, domestic travel or domestic residency, that states can impose certain residency requirements that are going to limit the right of people to move freely uh, among the states. Uh, and we have just experienced in this past week the most massive restriction on individual travel in American history, and it's being imposed on people who have proper documentation to at least be residents of the United States um, and to have extended stays here. Um, this is not being... Uh, imposed on those who ha have uh, uh, no legal documentation to be here. And it's being uh, imposed only on those who meet a certain religious test. And it, so it's a, a, a double impropriety. But uh, people should remember that the right to privacy is recognized in the Constitution. You are right that we have ceded an awful lot of that with these automated toll systems, which uh, do keep a record of not only the day but the hour and the second in which we passed a certain uh, checkpoint, uh, mainly uh, a toll plaza, but now more and more, and more in the West Coast than here on the East Coast, but uh, um, there are uh, uh, sensors embedded in the highway that mark when a vehicle goes across them and thereby is incurring a toll. 
so that tolls now do not have to be from one checkpoint to another, but can be down to the smallest foot, can be uh, down to the nearest part of a cent, a cent or a penny. Uh, and yes, indeed, we have given over to the government uh, the entitlement to keep track of our movements in that way. And that information is preserved, and some law enforcement investigations have uh, demanded that information to try to uh, test mainly the alibis of people who said they were not there at a certain time, uh, when in fact the uh, toll system can provide documentation of an alibi or the opposite, the, uh, the lack of an alibi. Um, and then the cameras uh, throughout metropolitan areas and uh, have certainly intruded upon the right, maybe we shouldn't call it travel, but the right to move freely from place to place. And it's been a great boon to law enforcement. Yes, I realize that, but uh, it has also been used for frivolous purposes. And um, it's a way for the press to get exciting stories. But uh, we uh, now, I think, have totally lost the right to uh, move throughout a city without documenting uh, our movements. And uh, there are those that say, both with automobile surveillance and individual surveillance by camera, that uh, when we're in public, we uh, give up the right to privacy. And that's not true at all. There are many activities that take place in public that uh, are regarded as being protected by the right to privacy, including certain uh, political activities and the right to right to read if you happen to do it in public. But uh, what's very intrusive about this current uh, environment is that uh, the, the, we're not simply subjecting ourselves to the eyes of a alert police officer or somebody who's stalking us. We're, we're providing a blow-by-blow uh, -blow, uh, record of where we are during any given day, and it is preserved in perpetuity in many cases, both as a digital footprint or as a, uh, a camera uh, video record, and that video record can be accessed, can be searched, can be researched by uh, uh, face recognition, by somebody who meets particular facial characteristics, so that it's not a uh, uh, an idle uh, uh, database. It's a very active one, and that makes it uh, wholly different than the kind of observation we have put up with in the past because now that video record uh, can be searched by various criteria and turn up uh, us, ourselves. You certainly put your finger on uh, what we have done here. It's very obvious that both by uh, accepting automated to tolls, in many cases we do it because of the convenience, we have uh, kind of given up uh, ground on uh, the traffic light uh, cameras. I don't think it's safe I don't think it's correct to say we've agreed to that, but it has been imposed upon us and has come about. And also in rural areas, too, there are uh, cameras uh, keeping eyes on uh, freeways and other highways, um, not to mention drones that have the ability to track people and to f discover their movements. Also little attachments to the bumpers of people's cars that can be linked to satellites and thereby uh, track people's um, movements in a vehicle uh, for uh, days and days and days, as long as that battery lasts. Um, we, we have uh, allowed a society in an environment in which all of that now is possible. And we don't feel the impact of that if we're law-abiding citizens, but we have allowed the government to impose upon us a system that uh, may at some at some time be turned against us. And in the end, uh, what, what if a person wants to reclaim some semblance of their innate uh, rights to autonomy and personhood, freedom of movement, of thought? Uh, that's the other thing in each of these areas. When these things came out of the physical realm and moved into the virtual electronic realm, it's like we almost entirely lose the ability to... to uh, have ownership of it and, and control over it. You know, if you're, you mentioned reading a book in public. Okay. If you're reading a book in public, what the contents is of that book is your own private 
knowledge because you you're holding an asset that asset contains information you have it it's in your possession physically and you can avail yourself of that information as nobody's business around you but if there are no books you know we, we always talk about oh it's a terrible the nazi society was terrible from book burning you know, book burning is just almost synonymous with totalitarianism and and that mind control and all that's horrible 1984 but look, ask me people, how many times have they read a physical book versus how many times they've searched online or done e-books and that sort of thing? If, if we are opting out of a society where, where there won't be books and now we're just going to, the only time you can read is when you're reading by permission of the system and by tracking of the system. It's a mind shift that we really, people have to think about. Same with the cashless society. If you can't hold money, uh, the various countries are, are making it, you know, they're India and and others are pressing to get rid of their higher denominations down to very low denomination bills and and, and more and more and more of our, our transactions have become uh, electronic so if you if you can't hold your funds then if you want access to your money it's not really yours if you can't hold it you've got to go ask permission to get it uh, and move it to someplace else where you still can't hold it that kind of thing um, what can we do to reclaim any semblance of uh, this innate right to autonomy over our thoughts and our movement and our privacy. I discovered just last month that my Kindle device had been hacked, and that was a very scary notion to think, first of all, that there would be any interest in doing that, and secondly, that that could be done. Um, and I was told by the Kindle people that that was a means of hacking into my uh, desktop computer. And uh, a very scary notion, but it it illustrates to us exactly what you're saying, that uh, when you're using uh, digital forms of uh, uh, learning, uh, you do make yourself vulnerable to tracking of, of, of that uh, information acquisition. Uh, I think that uh, I can give some general principles. One, I've already said that alter your patterns, you know, write a physical check uh, here and there every so often, and uh, sometimes use a credit card, sometimes use a debit card, uh, sometimes use a, a different credit card. I always think you should use a separate credit card online because if things go uh, bad, uh, it's hacked, uh, you can simply um, discontinue that account without much con inconvenience. So I would strongly recommend to use one credit card for online and one credit card for offline activities. But don't use the same credit card for your whole life uh, because that does create a archive of your comings and goings and your uh, commercial uh, uh, purchases. So vary it. Uh, change the pattern. Uh, I think that's anybody who's in the spy business will tell you that's what you do. You don't leave yourself open to patterns but you know don't drive to work the same way every single day uh bury that um secondly uh, uh know all you can about the technology and how it works and make sure you can confront any claims uh, about the technology uh, i remember in the early days of computing i asked why they wanted my social security number and the answer always was well the computer demands it well that wasn't true at all but we should know the capability of uh technology and make it work for us. I think we should use the technology for the important things in life and not frivolous things. I just think it's irresponsible to put up pictures of us in a drunken state or half-dressed on Facebook and really think that all of this uh, really powerful communications technology was created for that purpose. It, it was not. It was sort of keeping in touch with uh, both uh, our personal acquaintances, our family, and our uh, career um, associates. And I think it ought to be approached much more seriously. And uh, we shouldn't be awed by some of the frivolous applications of technology uh, that are offered to us. Um, and uh, I think we ought to develop a psychological sense of privacy, too, as well. That uh, We ought to think of ourselves as... Uh, foils to the government, not as uh, cooperative uh, pawns of the government. We we are, after all, citizens, and uh, many, many times I have exerted my rights to privacy. I have refused to uh, give up certain information, and maybe it's provided only psychological sense of privacy, but I think that's important. I think some of my friends would say uh, it's 
otherwise known as shooting yourself in the foot. I have done without transactions that uh, uh, I would not, because I would not provide a social security number or give up certain information. Uh, I don't use Facebook because I never trusted it, never at all. And people think maybe that I'm old fashioned. Uh, indeed, in some of my actions, my life has become a little less convenient, but I've developed a psychological sense of uh, privacy that uh, that I think is uh, extremely important. And I would hope all of us would do it. And then another bit of advice that I received long ago, but I always kind of had an instinct about it. Much of the invasions of privacy we deal with are commercially based. And if we can just say no in the marketplace to a lot of crap we don't need, uh, you'll find that you generate uh, less of a uh, portrait of you as a consumer. And uh, that's true of me. I receive minimal uh, uh, unwanted mail at home uh, simply because of that. Um, and I just don't participate in a lot of the foolishness over new gimmicks and new tangible items that I think my life is quite complete without. So that's another thing to keep in mind. The more you... Uh, opt in for new technology, for new stuff that you just have to have, the more you're responsive to advertising, whether it's by email or uh, uh, postal mail uh, or through um, mass media or social media, the more you do that, the more you're going to find yourself manipulated. You're going to find collections of information about yourself that are used to sell you more things that you don't want. So I would suggest people... Uh, Call it um, the uh, uh, temptation to just buy stuff, and you'll find much of your privacy will be enhanced. Well, Robert, where can people find out more of your work on Privacy Journal? Yeah, thanks for asking. I, I published a newsletter for the last 43 years uh, called Privacy Journal. It's a monthly newsletter, both available in hard copy and uh, by mail, and also a, um, in digital form by email. Uh, and people can opt for either one. And I try to tell people what their rights are, as I have done tonight. Also, uh, uh, what new laws are coming down the pike, what court decisions help or hurt privacy, and uh, how some of the new technology works. Try to explain it in lay terms. Uh, it's called Privacy Journal, and it's intended for people who, exactly like your audience, are trying to protect themselves in this uh, technological era. They can uh, send an email to us at orders at privacyjournal.net. They can find out more about the newsletter uh, at privacyjournal.net. We have some excerpts from prior issues. We have a page there that answers people's questions about protecting their privacy. And I hope people will subscribe. We have a special low price for those of, who are using this for uh, their own uh, personal enhancement, not for uh, corporate purposes. Uh, once again, a monthly newsletter called Privacy Journal, and we hope that we will uh, hear from people either through our website or by email. Well, Robert, thanks once again, as always, for joining us here again on Reluctant Preppers. Good uh, conversation. Thank you very much. You bet.